July, and I'm just so tempted to talk about the incredible feat of courage that occurred to bring our country into existence. You know, the, the whole idea that the people who started this country, I don't want to say our ancestors, because there are some people who, who have um, come into this country that aren't linked to those who um, brought forth the, uh, the War of Independence. I, however, have lineage on both sides of my family of people who signed the Declaration of Independence. I was born out of rebels and I'm proud of it. <laughs> and I'm so tempted to go into my normal 4th of July thing that says, you know, there was this huge feudal system in Europe and our the, the people that, that started this country, they left that. What courage does it take to abandon your life, your relatives, your means of employment, wherever it is you're living, your farm or your home or whatever, and set sail for some place unknown? I know that a lot of people in this room moved to Asheville, and that was a big high-stress experience. You have to pack everything up. You've got to give stuff away. You've got to decide what you're going to keep. You've got to put it usually in a, a U-Haul or hire the movers to come and move you. How many people moved to Asheville? Yes, look at this. Now, the people who moved to what was then being called the new land didn't have the luxury of packing a lot of stuff up. They would pick one or two things. Then they would get on a boat and they would sail to some far away place where they didn't really know what was going on. And yes, I know that the Indians, the Native Americans had it first, but you know, there's a record that there was even a people before the Native Americans. Wow. And so they came to this country and they just, they, they were a different kind of person. I think they were light bearers. I think there was an evolution of consciousness going on because they said, I am not willing to be oppressed anymore. I'd rather die. I'd rather die at sea. I'd rather go to this new place and die. There's something within me that yearns for freedom so much that I will no longer allow the strict hierarchy of Europe, the feudal system, that said you've got no place to go no matter what your talents, no matter what your aspirations. You can't get out of where you are. This is your life. And they say, rather than live a life like that, I would rather go into the unknown and risk it all. And I'll leave most of what I have behind. There was a consciousness there. There was a consciousness of being willing to give everything up to go for an idea of freedom. Nathan Henry, give me freedom or give me death. Or Nathaniel Hawthorne, whoever that was. <laughs> one, one of the mates. <laughs> There's this idea that says, I'm not going to put up with the old anymore. And you know, the, the whole feudal system didn't last much longer after the birth of this country. There was the French Revolution where the heads were lopped off. <laughs> well, you know. People say enough is enough. There was a, a change in consciousness that said, we're going to do something differently. We're going to give the power to the people. The, the whole idea that all men, notice it was men, all men are created equal. We'll leave that one alone. <laughs> and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable <coughs> rights among them, is the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so here's this burgeoning consciousness that says everybody has a chance. Everybody can make it or break it on their own. You're not going to be held back just because of your position in life. Now, it took us a while to catch up. You're not going to be held back because of your race. You're not going to be held back because of your gender. You're not going to be held back because of these outside circumstances. We're still a work in progress. And we're still catching up to our noblest of ideas. I want so much to go into the amazing esoteric symbolism 
of our country. The idea that we have a shield and an olive branch on our great seal. Not a shield and a spear. Wouldn't that make more sense? To attack, to defend? No. That the highest means of protection is the olive branch of peace. That our highest ideal is to be at peace. The pyramid with the capstone not set yet, that we're not finished. And then there's a big eye in it. What's that? But the third eye, the eye that sees truth. We were created out of a very unique lot of people, very esoteric. In God we trust, e pluribus unum. One out of many, many out of one. That there's only one, even though it looks like many. And yet, what I'd really like to talk, you notice how I slipped all that good stuff in there? <laughs> what I really want to talk about is this idea of freedom. And that freedom, although it is one of my favorite words, ubiquitous, which means it's omnipresent, it's everywhere present, is not free. Freedom is not free. And I'm not going to go into how uh, we fought wars to protect freedom. I'm, I'm, I'm still saying we're a work in progress and we're evolving to a higher level. But just because freedom is all around us doesn't mean <coughs> that we get to use it, that we get to have it without any effort. Emerson said we pay for everything in mental and spiritual coin. Everything comes with a price tag. And I know that there have been times in my life when I have left a situation, whether it was a, a marriage or a job or a geographical place, where I've left a situation and felt this incredible burden released off of me and I've taken a deep breath and went, wow, I'm free. And yet to look back on that, that didn't just happen. Has anyone gone through a relationship breakup? <laughs> What a lot of work. When John and I got married some 22 years ago, this is not a pop quiz, uh, we had a, um, a, a, a wedding invitation and it said Barbara Bonacorso, because that was my name at the time, and John Waterhouse are getting married. And then you open it up and it said for the last time. <laughs> that divorces are just too painful and we didn't want to do that again that we would not do that again because even though the sense of freedom of leaving marriage number one long-term living relationship marriage number two even though that sense of freedom was so great it cost so much to get there that I don't want to put myself in that position again and so when I look at the circumstances in my life, when I've had great freedom, I know that it took great effort. How many people are not coming to the firewalk? Not coming to the firewalk because there is no way they want to walk on fire. You people are out of your minds. <laughs> that fire, by the time we walk on it, is 1,400 degrees. They melt engine blocks at that temperature. 1,400 degrees, and we've got our little pants rolled up, and we've got our socks and shoes off, and we're going, I can walk on fire, I can do anything. We're crazy. But the sense of freedom that comes after that is amazing. Even when we go and we say, is this mine to do, and we get a no, and we pull back and go back into the circle. That sense of freedom that says, I can trust my intuition, I can trust my wisdom, I can trust my guidance, is so huge. But we have to do something for that. We've got to show up. We've got to be willing to have our lives be different. We've got to be willing to take the action necessary to create our lives anew. And then we get that incredible sense of freedom. Some people come into this teaching and they think, that since freedom is right there, ready 
for you at any moment. They can just sit back and wait for it. Well, I'm in a self-imposed bondage of a life that I don't like, of finances that are restrictive, of a body that doesn't work or look the way I would like it to. I am in a self-imposed prison of my own making, and I'm just going to sit back and wait for freedom. <laughs> it's kind of like someone saying, well, air is all around you. Freedom is all around you. Air is all around you. All you have to do is breathe it in to get it. And someone says, I'm just going to sit back and wait for air. <laughs> How long does that work? And then to look at that and say, well, there is no air. Ridiculous. That's very limited. What it requires is for us to bring that air into our body. It can be all around us, and if we're not breathing it in, it's not going to help us. And anyone who has ever had asthma knows what that is like. The air is all around you, but you can't quite get it in. You can't quite breathe it. Freedom is all around you, and yet there is always a way you will pay for it. You're going to pay for it in mental coin, Emerson says, or you're going to pay for it in spiritual coin. Mental coin would be the clear day that Diane sang about. You know some days when you're just crystal clear, you're glowing, you can see forever, on a clear day, those days when you are crystal clear about who you are, about where you're going, about what's happening, that's a price that you pay. How much did it cost you to go from being confused to being clear? Cost a lot. You had to let go of all of the perks of confusion. And there are perks of confusion. I am one who hung out. Ugh. I'm one who hung out in confusion for decades. Why? Because then I didn't have to show up. I didn't have to be who I've come here to be. I didn't have to be powerful. I didn't have to be great because I was confused. And so I would let other people tell me what to do, and I would let other people direct my life so that I could hold myself back and hide under confusion. But when I was confused, I was not free because I wasn't willing to pay the price for freedom. And I'd love to tell you that I walked into my first Science of Mind Center and I got it and all of a sudden I was crystal clear. I wasn't. I wasn't. I worked with this for years and years and years and years. I'd get a glimpse of clarity and I'd run back into confusion. And then I'd work, 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 work. I'd do groups. I'd do journaling. I'd go to classes. I'd read. I'd books stacked up all around me. I was not in a relationship at that time. And I would lay in bed and I would read and I would meditate and I would chant and I would do all of this work to get a glimpse of clarity. And then I would fall back into confusion. <coughs> but after decades of work, I feel like I'm pretty clear. At least I'm really aware when I'm hiding. At least I'm really aware of when I fall back into confusion. And then I am willing to pay the price to go back into clarity because that's my ticket to freedom. My ticket to freedom is to take responsibility for my life. I can't put it outside of myself and expect to be free. It's like we pour the foundation, we put the bars up, we put a little cot, a little sink, a little toilet, and we put a door and we put a lock on it and then we put the key in our pocket and we blame the rest of the world for the fact that we are not free. We can blame our childhood. We can blame our exes or our current partners. We can blame our genetics. We can blame our socioeconomic status. We can blame our bank accounts. But the cool thing about this idea of our country is that it says none of that matters. It's all on you. You can either step up or you can just give up. And if you decide to step up, none of that other stuff matters, but there is a price to pay. And I'm not saying that we need to go to war for this, unless you're talking about going to war with that stinking thinking, limited saboteur that lives inside of most of us. I'm not saying everyone. 
And if we want to take that one on and say, you will not hold me back anymore. I will not indulge in the limiting idea that I am less than who I am simply for the sake of not having to put effort out. Isn't it amazing what we give up over? What we give up over. Some of us give up over a person. I don't like you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Who cares? You know there are seven billion other people on the planet, most of whom would like you if they had a chance. <laughs> give up over, give up over a job. It's not even our passion, it's not even our career, it's not even our calling, it's just a job. We give up over money. Money's got some cool imagery on it, but all it is is paper. All it is is paper. I'm collecting hundred dollar bills, I'm having such a good time. <laughs> and when I get out all of my hundred dollar bills and play with them, what I notice, other than they're really cool, and they're Ben Franklin, I've got all the new ones, if I get an old one, I'll take it back to the bank to get a new one. It's just paper. It's just paper. It's the value that we place upon it. What do we give up over? How do we give ourselves away? How do we crumble? How do we fall back? How do we walk back into that prison that we built and shut the door? and sit there and feel sorry for ourselves. And if we're not going to do that, what are we willing to do to experience that incredible ex life of freedom that not only did the people who founded this country promise us, but it is our God-given right. It's our God-given right to be free. And we now are the way showers. We are the light bearers of the consciousness change on planet Earth. I think a couple of hundred years ago, we were connected with people who brought forth an amazing idea. It said, given their own devices, people will do what's best for everyone. They do, maybe not in every situation, but collectively we do. The idea of democracy is moving all around the country, all around the world, and, and I'm so, um, chuckled with the idea that says, okay, democracy has to look like the U.S. No, it doesn't. It just means people get to pick. So when Russia went from, when, when the Ukraine went from communism to uh, a, a, an elected government, and then they voted back in the Communist Party, they get to do that. That's their choice. That's the way they want it. You get to have it the way you want it. When we decide that collectively we're going to do what's best for all of us, we get to have that, and frankly, it's good for them. Isn't that crazy? I was brought up with this idea that communism is bad, and yet the communist system of government in Ukraine takes better care of the people than they were doing by themselves. Now, they may choose to vote in a different kind of a government later, next year, 10 years from now, that's their choice. But right now, that's what they get to do. So here's this idea that says, left to our own devices, we will all pick what's best for all of us. And if we don't have some outside structure holding us down, we can do amazing things. We can change the world. We can bring forth peace. We can take care of everybody on the planet. If we don't have some outside structure holding us down, we can do amazing things. It's fascinating what's happening economically in countries like India, in countries like Af in, in continents like Africa, in the sub-Saharan deserts in Africa, because there is not that strong, and even in China, there's not, China doesn't have a very good government. You know, they used to, the whole Tiananmen Square thing, they used to have a very strong government. Now their government's not doing so well, they're just not quite able to pull off the whole dictatorial thing which is great because the Chinese people are rising up. They're not rising up in rebellion. They're rising up in economic prosperity because there's not something on the outside pushing them down. They're doing business with each other. There's more of a flow. There's more food. 
They're making more money. They're doing trade with countries like the United States. Call it good or bad, that's what's happening. When we let go of the idea that says you can't, the natural human spirit is, of course I can. Of course I can. And when we allow ourselves to step forward into this idea that says, I'm willing to pay the price. I'm willing to pay the price to live the life that I want to live. Because otherwise, I'm sitting on the couch holding my breath, wondering where the air is. I love this teaching. It doesn't promise something for nothing. It doesn't promise something for nothing. It promises something for something. It says that as you become that which you want, then you experience the manifestation of that which you have become. So the choice is, is to become it. What do I need to do to become it? Well, I have to stop being the person that doesn't have the life that I want. I've got to stop it. Sometimes that's the hardest part. Stopping complaining. Stopping gossiping. Stopping being angry. Stopping feeling sorry for yourself. Stopping being constricted. Let go. Let go and see what happens. What's the worst thing that could happen? We could die, so what? So what? I'd rather die going for it than live here for hundreds of years feeling oppressed by my own limited belief system. What's the worst that could happen if you stop being the person that your biological family thinks you are? If you start being clear, if you start speaking words of truth, if you start manifesting that which you want, what's the worst that can happen? Some people think the worst that can happen is that they could live the life that they've always wanted to live. It's a good thing. Might be a little scary. I love that quote that Edwin gives about Mario Andretti, who says, if your palms aren't sweaty, you're not going nearly fast enough. <laughs> If you're not paying the price for anything, you're not going to get anything. You're not going to buy anything. It's like going into the store without any money, without any credit cards, without any way of procuring stuff. You're just window shopping and wishing and hoping. That's not for us. That's not for us. We're the ones who've come to planet Earth to have a new world. We are the ones who have come to planet Earth to open up the way for an elevation, a shift, an awakening of consciousness that says not only is freedom for each and every one of us, but we can have it because we're willing to go for it. We're willing to be different. We're willing to stand and say, bring your friends. How many people brought their friends? We're willing to stand up here and say, God's right inside of you that you can create the life that you want. We're willing to say, let's build a fire, rake out the coals and walk on it. We are the ones who are willing to say that we have the power to reach out into thin air and grab what we want out of life. We are the ones. And if that gives us some things that we have to pay for, so what? So what? Nobody has to live in a prison, even those who actually find themselves in prison. I love the story of Viktor Frankl, who was in the concentration camp. He wrote Man's Search for Meaning. And he said, they could take my body, but they couldn't take my mind. They couldn't take my soul. They couldn't take my spirit. And so no matter what they did to him, he went for a walk. He had three paces. One, two, three. He was up against the wall. He'd turn around. One, two, three. Three, he was up against the wall. He said he walked all over Europe. <laughs> he met the most wonderful people. He had such an amazing time in that concentration camp. He didn't pay attention to the pain. He didn't pay attention to the suffering. He didn't pay attention to what they were doing to him. He paid the price to go for a walk, to discipline his thought to take him where he wanted to go. Even people who find themselves in what we would call hard and fast jails have the ability to have freedom. None of us are in that position. None of us even have little ankle tracking bracelets on. So if there's anything in your life that you're not free about, it's simply because you went window shopping and for
forgot to bring something to pay for it with. And the good thing about that is that you don't have to go home. You can just reach inside of yourself and pull out whatever price it costs to be who you have come here to be and to live the life that you have come here to live. There's a phrase that goes around that says, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Those people who left all and came to this country to try a new idea that says, if you don't stop me, I can do anything. I can create a whole system of government. I can create a whole way of being that can spread around this entire globe and remind people that freedom is their natural birthright. And I will do whatever it takes to get there. I will die at sea. I will go to war. I will give up everything that I have. I will do whatever it takes to get there. We stand on those shoulders. And I think that it is only natural for us to continue that growth into greater and greater levels of life, of liberty, of happiness, of freedom. Don't be, don't be afraid of the price that you pay. Don't be afraid if it costs leaving a job, moving far away, giving up the people that you thought were your friends. Don't be afraid if it costs change. Letting go of this idea that you are little and not important. Don't be afraid of the idea that you may fail, be embarrassed, or be laughed at. Pay the price for freedom. It's the only way to live. And so it is.